know this is the last session of a three-day conference and you're all tired. And I'll try to, I can't promise to be terribly interesting, but I'll try to keep you at least awake. What I want to talk to you about is this topic. It's sort of proverb-like. Cleanliness is next to domain specificity. And what I mean by that is, well, there's been a lot of talk about domain-specific languages and domain-specific code throughout the Ruby community. I don't think there's enough been said about how domain specificity helps you write better code. There's sort of academic exercise on, on creating a DSL for this and that, or, or identifying them here and there. But there's not really been sort of the focus on why you'd want to even really. So this talk is in two parts. The first part is, is a little more academic. It's, bas it's basically a, a little bit on linguistics and how it relates to the, the topic. And the second part is a little more practical. It's, uh, you'll actually see code. You'll know by have the big black background on the side, on the slide. Um, so let's get started. Before delving into the, the linguistics part, I want to talk a little bit about the Ruby community and one of the things I really, really like about it. I did my uh, graduate degree in philosophy. And I always said that the most educated people on the widest range of topics were philosophers. I could go to my thesis advisor and she would know about quantum physics and evolutionary biology. I could go to another teacher and he would be you know, well known in, uh, to economists across the world. It didn't seem to matter what the field was, philosophers knew something about it. And when I got into web development, that didn't seem to be the case anymore. I'm talking to PHP programmers who know some PHP, not even a lot of it, and that's all they really seem to know. And sometimes they knew English, it's questionable. Uh, sometimes they knew whatever their native language happened to be, also questionable. But when I came into the Ruby community, I found this interdisciplinary sort of spirit again, and I was really happy to see that. Um, you've actually heard a little bit about it already, because you heard Marcel's talk on the first day, where he talked about coming from literature. Um, Chad is, did music throughout college and still plays, as some of you who went to RailsConf might have heard his uh, renditions on the ukulele. And I, I really like that interdisciplinary nature. I think it adds a lot to whatever field you happen to be working in at the moment. And the relevance to this talk of that is that a lot of people have some expertise in linguistics as well in the Ruby community. Um, and even those who don't have picked up things here and there Linguistics runs throughout computer science in general. Right? We talk about programming languages, and we talk about how they're similar to or different from natural languages. And sometimes I think that metaphor can be taken too far, but I think there's always something we can learn from it. So let's delve into this particular topic uh, just a little bit. So in linguistics, we've got categories, right? The obvious one is language. What is a language? The working definition I'm going to use for this talk is that a language is a particular combination of a vocabulary and a grammar. So you've got all the words, and then you've got all the rules about how to put them together to make meaningful uh, structures. We also have other categories in linguistics, though. Uh, we have dialects, we have jargon, we have uh, pigeons and creoles, and we're going to talk about all those uh, as we go. But I really want to focus on language for just another second, because when I started off telling you about what the, topic's gonna, the talk is going to be about, I mentioned domain-specific languages. Right? So here's where we're applying the metaphor of linguistics of a language to something in computer science. So that, uh, we'll keep that in mind as we go through this next couple slides. So a dialect is different from a language, right? We all, it should be, they have different names. They've got to be different, right? The weird thing about dialects is that there's not really a, a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for something to be called a dialect versus a language. You have things as close as, as British English and American English and Canadian English. And you've got uh, things wildly divergent in both grammar and vocabulary. One of the, the classic examples of a regional dialect are the generic, what people call soft drinks. So if you go into McDonald's and you say, I want random soft drink, what do you say? So I grew up here, actually like just next door to Charlotte, and we always called it a Coke. Even if it's a Pepsi, it's still a Coke. I have friends who grew up in the Pacific Northwest, and they call it soda, or actually pop in the Pacific Northwest. Soda out on the West Coast and up in the Northeast. And then there are some people who just call it completely random other things, and I don't know what that could 
possibly be. So there are distinct differences in vocabulary bounded geographically. Right? So these are regional dialects. Um, I guess in Indiana they call water fountains bubblers. Uh, things like that, right? There's, I want to show you another example of regional dialects that I found in college. Um, how many of you grew up with little bunny foo-foo? Okay, what I discovered in college is that depending on where you're from, the good fairy says different things and he gets turned into different things. So when I grew up, uh, the good fairy says, I don't want to see you, uh, actually, does anybody not know Little Bunny Foo-Foo? Okay, <laughs> so maybe I should say this first. Little Bunny Foo-Foo is a children's rhyme. And it goes, uh, Little Bunny Foo-Foo hopping through the forest, scooping up the field mice and bopping them on the head. Down came the good fairy and she said, and this is where they start to diverge and this is my version I'm telling you, Little Bunny Foo-Foo, I don't want to see you scooping up the field mice and bopping them on the head. I'll give you three chances, and then I'm going to turn you into a goon. And then it goes on through various verses. He keeps bopping the field mice on the head, gets turned into a goon. So in college, um, actually in grad school, I, I met a couple people in my program who were from Winnipeg in Canada. And they have a slightly different version. A uh, little, little bunny foo-foo is hopping through a forest. Good friend comes down. She says, I don't like your attitude. I never understood this because it doesn't even rhyme, right? <laughs> yeah. But then they go on, and instead of being turned into a goon, little bunny foo is going to be turned into a flugelboo, which again, doesn't make sense. Not even a thing, right? So it's just another example of how things differ regionally. It's, it's another dialect. I don't know that this one has particularly been studied. If there are any linguists in the audience, I offer it. You know, send in grants to the NIH. Right? Mm -hmm. Little rabbit food. Oh, it's craziness. I mean, <laughs> is nothing sacred. That little bunny foo foo can't be little bunny foo foo everywhere in the world. So, so that's a dialect, right? We also have things like jargons. Uh, if you walk into a waffle house and you listen to what the the wait staff tells the kitchen, it's like another like another language. It's not actually a language. It's a dialect, right? Um, and then we have things like cants, which you don't hear much anymore unless you're a big role-playing game guy. Uh, I was first introduced to it through uh, role-playing games when I was much younger, where the thief class had its own special language that they could talk to other thieves in and nobody else could understand them. So jargons and cants, like dialects, they're similar to languages, they're on a continuum. But jargons and cants, they differ in vocabulary, not in grammar. So if you have a jargon based in English, you're going to be using English grammar, but your words are going to be different. On sort of the further end of the spectrum, even more, well, more different from jargons and cants and dialects, you've got pigeons and creoles. Pigeons arise in a community where you have people who have different languages who have to interact. So in, um, like, colonies where you have, uh, say, New Orleans, right, you had the French and you had the Native Americans and you had the English all interacting there uh, back a couple hundred years ago, what you get is the people have to communicate, so they start taking each other's words from their languages and they put them together in really simple grammars. And so they're able to, to get by. Creoles are what their kids speak. So their kids grow up hearing the different words in a simplistic grammar and they synthesize it into something new that has a fully fledged, it's a completely new natural language that just happens to have words that sound like they came from elsewhere, because they did. Um, and the grammar can be significantly different or very similar to the, the parent languages. It's, uh, there's lots of interesting research on this. If you're interested, I can point you in the right direction. Um, but what I want to say is that this reinforces sort of my definition of a language, right? So I said a language is a vocabulary and a grammar. Pigeon, pigeons and creoles have a different grammar in their parent languages. So a creole actually is a full language of its own that arose in a certain way. Yes? Isn't one of the distinctions that pigeons are not grammatically consistent and creoles are? Pigeons, it depends on what you mean by grammatically consistent. Uh, all the examples of pigeons I know, um, they have grammars, but the grammars are incomplete. So they can't express, like sometimes they, uh, this is, you know, out of nowhere, fully made up example, but they might not have the past perfect tense. They might just have the past tense. So it, it, pigeons aren't full languages, they're just sort of hacks, if you will, linguistic hacks. 
and Creoles are what they grow into when they, they become big daddy languages, or mommy languages. So, so languages are vocabulary and grammar. Pigeons and Creoles differ in both grammar and vocabulary from their parent languages. Things like dialects, jargons, they don't differ in grammar, they just differ in vocabulary. And usually it's a, a, lim, it's a limited subset of the, the parent language's vocabulary, because all, all the words they have, you know, they're in the parent language, they're just less frequent. So given that, let's, let's bring it sort of back to Ruby. And my argument is that most of what we hear uh, advertised as domain-specific languages in Ruby, they're not languages, right? Because they don't have a different grammar. They just have a different vocabulary. So you've got the whole realm of Ruby domain-specific code, and it's well and good. And then you've got a little chunk of it that actually is its own language. And, and, you know, the prime offenders, active record's not a language. It's a domain-specific structure that describes relational databases. Um, it has a different vocabulary than Ruby. It adds things like has many, has and belongs to many, has one, belongs to, all that. But if you look at it, there's nothing in the way the terms are connected that you can't do in Ruby, because it's just Ruby, right? It's just Ruby with a specific accent. Similarly, RSpec. Right? I think RSpec is fantastic. It's domain-specific code describing a particular way of thinking about your code. And we're going to talk more about this in a little bit. Um, but it's not a language. Both Active Record and RSpec and just a ton of other examples are just Ruby. They have Ruby's grammar. They have all that that allows. They have a different vocabulary. Now, at this point, you may be saying, who cares? Isn't this just a semantic discussion? Okay, Ryan cares. So if you're saying who cares, take it up with him. And he's BA, so walk softly when you take it up with him. So <laughs> we're treading very closely to the old uh, question of how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Um, I actually think that's a valid question and very interesting in its own medieval philosophy way. Um, but this, this, does, this distinction does matter. So it really does matter what we call a language versus a dialect. I'm going to use dialect from here on out just because it's the one I'm most comfortable with. And the reason it matters is because DSLs intimidate and frighten people, especially new programmers, right? This is my DSL zombie. Um, I, I only bring him out on special occasions. But uh, I'd like to tell a little story about not the DSL zombie, but how DSLs intimidate and frighten. So soon after I got into being paid for Ruby code, I went to the Northern Virginia Ruby group, Ruby user group. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently we have someone from Northern Virginia here. Um, and I was fortunate enough to hear Rich Kilmer talk. And Rich was actually talking about DSLs, and I'm using L non-ironically. He was talking about real languages. He, he wrote for, I believe it was managing air traffic like planes flying all over the place and they're all living on, in a Ruby DSL and it was crazy and, and way over my head and scared the crap out of me. Because I, I, I was a PHP programmer looking at this, what? I had no idea. Right. So at that point I was really intimidated by the, the prospect of, is this how you're supposed to write Ruby code? Are you supposed to be doing all this crazy crap that you can't get from any manual ever written? And the answer to that actually is no. You don't need to write a parser. You already got a perfectly good parser written by that guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> and thank you, Matt. <laughs> um, Ruby's grammar is, is crazy flexible. right? It lets you do almost anything you need to do. I, I think no hands were harmed in the, the taking of this picture. Uh, I'm not sure how they took it. I don't want to speculate too much. But back to the point, right? Ruby is, you can change anything about it you want. So if you need to write a parser, you could, but you don't have to. You don't have to go to that scary place, right? It's, it's easy to get things done without being that in depth. And the way you do that is by changing the vocabulary. So when you change the vocabulary, you change the world, right? I'm not paid by NBC for any plugs that might happen on my slides. Pardon? Uh, that was the approach in 1984, certainly, right, with Newspeak. Uh, 
Um, the question is, wasn't that the Soviet approach? And we could probably argue politics all you wanted. Um, this approach can be used for good or evil. Yes. This approach is neither good nor evil on its own. It's up to you to use it properly, or you define properly. So the point is, because Ruby gives us all this flexibility, we can get a lot of the benefit of a real DSL that we'd have to work really hard to do in another language just by changing the words we use without worrying about the, the rules by which they're combined. And this might all sound an awful lot just like an API at this point, right? Because if it's just the words you use, then it's just how external things interact with your program, where those external things are you, know, you the programmer, other programmers reading your code, other code connecting to your code, right? They care about the words. I think it's an important distinction because an API is actually a broader term than a, a, than a domain-specific dialect. Right? API is neutral with respect to... When you hear something's an API, you look at it, you have no expectations about what it's going to look like. It could look like SOAP. It could look like XML RPC. It could look like REST, right? It could look like something that reflects the problem space or something wildly divergent with totally obfuscated. It could look like Perl. A dialect, on the other hand, if you hear something's a dialect, then you expect it to adhere to certain rules. So if I tell you that Active Record is a dialect for talking about relational databases, you're going to expect a certain level of clarity in the methods and the classes that are there that you don't get with an API. So while everything I'm going to talk about is actually an API, I think that's doing a disservice, right? You're ignoring a valuable part of the code, this intention to communicate more clearly. So why do we care at all? Why would we care about domain specificity? And there's a really good reason for it. Um, I mentioned earlier that it was to communicate more clearly, right? To, to reflect the problem space. And those are sort of abstract. But, okay, so we started linguistics. We moved over to Ruby. Now we're going to move back to linguistics. Does anybody know who these two people are? Either, or either one of them, I guess. John McCarthy? Yes. Do you know which is which? No. Okay. It was just a guess, actually. Yes. Okay. So the guy on the right is Edward Sapir. The guy on the left is his student, Benjamin Worf. He looks kind of model-y, maybe like an actor. This is the only picture I could find of him. I couldn't find anything that made him look ugly and linguistic-like. Um, so if you don't know who Sapir and Worf are, they were two linguists... People argue over whether one was actually primarily an insurance salesman or not. Um, but they, they did a number of studies on languages around the world, and they came up with some ideas that have had far-reaching consequences, including in the Ruby world. People like to talk about these guys, or how these guys have been represented. So the way you hear about them is by something called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, that neither nor both of them either actually advocated are you seeing the Perl one on there? There's a category Perl in there somewhere. But it really is about Ruby at that point. Um, so the Zipir Whorf hypothesis comes in two flavors. There's the strong flavor, which is also sometimes called linguistic determinism. It's the idea that the language you speak determines the thoughts that you can have. So if you didn't have a word for hot or cold, uh, any temperature words, you wouldn't actually be able to think about temperature in the same way that people who did have those words could think about it. And the experimental, I put little scare quotes around that, the experimental evidence for this comes from the Hopi, uh, Native Americans in the Southwest. They don't have tenses. The native Hopi tongue does not have tenses like uh, English and most other languages around the world do. They actually have two, and I could get this wrong, so if there are any Hopi native speakers in the audience, feel free to correct. Um, there's manifested, which refers to everything concrete that or has happened in the past, is currently happening. And there's becoming manifested, which is for things abstract that are in the future, or maybe being planned. And Worf was the, the member of the pair who went and lived among the Hopi, or talked to them at least. And he theorized that since they didn't have tenses like we do, and since he didn't see a lot of talk about time the way that we talk about time, they weren't actually using the same concepts of time that we were. Um, it was a, he conceived of it as a much more fluid idea of time as, a, as like a big cup of water and there, every day is a new cup and ooh, mumbo jumbo. Um, it turns out that this interpretation of the theory is crap. 
as so many strong versions where a theory comes in two flavors, come, it, the strong one's crap. Right? Uh, just because the Hopi don't have the same words doesn't mean they don't recognize that days are different or that you know something's happening in five hours, which means it's not happening now and not happening tomorrow. Right? They can differentiate. It, they, they have concepts of time. Right? So moving on to the weaker, less crap theory, we've got linguistic relativism. And the way this is weaker is instead of your language determining the thoughts you can have, it sort of influences the way you think about things. So you can think of it sort of like a river. Right? So at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon, obviously the Colorado River can't flow anywhere that's not in the Grand Canyon because it's huge sides, right? How's the water going to get over? That would be linguistic determinism. On the other hand, you could have a little stream bubbling merrily, maybe little bunny foo foos hopping beside it. And there are gradual hills where the water actually as, as the stream increases, the water can sort of flow wider and out, and it has more flexibility, right? But the hills sort of guide it through. So, and this is my guiding through hand motion. What happens then is that when you start talking in a specific language or thinking in a, shouldn't go there, talking in a specific language, uh, you're, you, can't, you can still have all the same thoughts you could before, but you're just sort of inclined in certain directions. And the classic experimental uh, data for this is the Eskimo, the Great Eskimo Snow Word Hoax. So there's actually a book by that title if you want to go look it up. Um, you might have heard that the Eskimos have 33,000 words for snow. Yay! Because they live amongst the snow and they can, they can differentiate, you know, this snow is blah and this snow is double blah. Or uh, this snow is Kanuk and this, this snow is Kanek. Um, there are a couple problems with the statement that Eskimo has 33 billion, billion words for snow. Uh, one is there's no Eskimo language. There's, um, Eskimo is, is it's sort of an amorphous you know, term for all the Native American tribes who each speak different languages who live up there. Up there being the way northwest Canada. Um, so what this, chart, or this slide is, is a list of the sum of the words, as you can tell by the dot, dot, dot. Uh, some of the words that relate to snow from a particular language in the Eskimo family of languages. I don't remember which one, so please don't ask. Now, the interesting thing is that these aren't all synonyms for what we would call snow. They're not actually subtle differentiations in snow character. Um, instead, they're all terms for snow-related stuff. And so I put up this list. These are not translations. This is just a list of similarly related words in English. So. One of those words over there might mean powder, and one might mean slush. You know, we don't normally call those snow. We call them powder and slush. We have words for them. Um, pingo, if you're wondering, it's an ice lens. It's a borrowed word just like igloo is. But apparently it's a valid English word. You can use it in Scrabble. Score big points or not. Um, so what this slide shows is that, yeah, they have a lot of words for snow. That doesn't necessarily mean they can differentiate any better than we do, because we also have a lot of words for snow. There might be a, a language out there that from, has never had to experience snow, maybe a tropical tongue. And they might not have any words for snow, and maybe you know, maybe you should study those. But the Eskimo snow words are never really compared to them. They're compared to English. So this study, this I hesitate to call it a study even, this uh, you know, wild evidence throwing, possibly with no experimental data behind it, um, that's not so good. This one's better. Different languages have different numbers and kinds of words for color. Russian, apparently, I'm not a Russian speaker again, if any Russian speakers track me, has two words for blue. There's a light blue and a dark blue term. Um, there's a language from Indonesia, I'm not making it up just because I'm holding my hands up, uh, that has two color words. There's one for warm colors and one for cool colors. Um, and they don't really differentiate within that. So what people have done is they give native speakers of various languages a set of tiles of various colors and they ask them to categorize. So they might say uh, to kids, uh, pick out the red tile, uh, pick out a red tile, and they pick out a red tile. And is there another red tile? And so they get one that's darker. And, and they keep doing that until they have all the, the tiles that the kids are willing to call red. So the interesting thing is that when a language has X or Y, you know, more or less terms for colors, those are reflected in how they differentiate or when they are doing this tile matching task. Um, the other interesting thing is that when you take an English speaker and you give them artificial color words for tones, so you have blue, right? You've got green over here, 
uh, and violet over here. And then, so these parts are blue, right? This part's sort of violety, and this part's sort of greenish. Um, when you name these two parts of blue and train up an English speaker over like 500 iterations, bring them back in the next day, they're just as good at differentiating that, that artificial color, what we in English would call an artificial color uh, division, as a native speaker um, like from Russian would in those two blues. So it seems that when you have names for stuff, you're able to differentiate it better, which lends support to the weak superior wharf hypothesis. It still gives you two questions, uh, you know, minimally two questions. Obviously, there are way more. The first is the direction of causality. Is it that the language affects the thought or the thought affecting the language? So once you're told to differentiate between these two, is it the language actually making the difference in behavior? Or is it the thinking and the language is just sort of an epiphenomenon? Um, or is, were you enabled of differentiating those before we gave you the, the artificial color terms? And, and that's something, you know, for the scientists to worry about, the non-computer scientists. Well, anybody, any scientist, any sciencey person, yes. The second question is the degree of influence. Um, so it looks like there's an effect, but how strong is that effect? How, how strongly does language influence people's thought patterns? Uh, they don't influence thoughts directly. It's just sort of, remember, it's just sort of guiding you, there's the hand motion again, um, in certain directions. And I think these are interesting questions. They're probably outside the scope of a RubyConf talk, uh, maybe belonging more in a linguistics talk, so we're going to move on. The reason I took that fairly lengthy diversion into Sapir Whorf is because RSpec loves Sapir Whorf. You ask anyone involved in RSpec and they'll talk to you about Sapir Whorf until your ears fall off. And perhaps that's mean to you for your ears or to them because they're not that obsessed with it. Um, but I've talked to David Chalemsky and I've seen posts from Ozluck, um where they, they explicitly identify Sapir Whorf as an influence on RSpec. And the way that works, and they, if they were here they could correct me if I was wrong, they're not, so I'm just going to pretend I'm right. The words you use influence the way you think about things. Uh, when your thinking changes, your behavior changes. So the goal, one of the goals of RSpec is to get you to write better code by getting your assumptions and what you want to happen set down first, right? Testing for that is too late in the process. Tests happen after the fact. In school, you learn about something, then you're tested on it. If I asked you to measure the height of someone, when they weren't in the room, you couldn't do it until they came in the room, and then you can measure it. Specifications, on the other hand, come first. If I tell you what you're gonna learn, I'm specifying what you're gonna learn, then, then I can teach it to you. I can't specify what you're going to learn after I've already taught it to you. That's testing. Similarly with the height issue, I can specify how high somebody has, how tall someone has to be to ride a ride. And then after they show up, I can test them to make sure that they're tall enough to ride the ride. So here, here we've already got the queer distinction, right? We've got testing, which happens after the fact, sort of subconsciously, we think of it as happening after stuff. And we've got specifying, which happens before, you know, sub, again, subconsciously, we're thinking that it happens before things. Um, incidentally, this means that test-driven development might be considered an oxymoron. You can't drive from the back seat. You can't drive after it's already happened. So in BDD and in our spec, the use of terms like uh, specifications instead of tests and you know, matchers instead of assertions and things like that, it's, it's all made to lead you in the right direction, to lead you into specifying your code before you write it, to lead you into thinking about what your code has to do before you write the code that doesn't do what you wanted it to. So this is just an example of how domain-specific dialects, that's the, D, the L is now a D, right? they're built on the weak interpretation of superior wharf. Domain specificity is all about getting you to think in a particular way about the problem you're working on. In our spec, that's about writing better code through specifying its behavior before you write the code. In, um, in active record, that's making you remember that you're actually dealing with a database or with an object relational model. But it all comes down to keeping your head inside the domain you're working on. If you name all your things if you name all your variables with foobar and boz, you've, got, you've lost an extremely valuable way of tying yourself back to the problem space. Right. Take the example of a pilot for an airplane. So if I'm piloting an airplane, I'm writing, so actually, uh, autopilot, right? I'm writing software to pilot an airplane for me. 
because I'm not a particularly good pilot, I don't want to crash. If I name the plane foo, my variable representing the plane, and I name the pilot variable bar, and I name the, the yaw pitch or roll variable boz, then I've got foo, bar, and boz all over my code, and just looking at it, it's going to be harder to remember that, oh my gosh, this actually, this line of code right here flips the plane over seven times. Whereas if I name the pilot variable, I don't know, pilot, and the plane variable plane, and the, the yaw, roll, and, and pitch variables, yaw, roll, and pitch, it's going to be much easier to catch stuff like that. So keeping your head in the domain is a fundamental technique of writing better code. And to see how this, to see to some extent how this works, I've got a refactoring example. Hey, refactoring code. Everybody loves code. Now there's an important proviso on this example. Uh, whenever, especially when you're dealing with domain specificity, people like different things. Different, based on your experience and how you tend to work and how you tend to speak, what's going to make sense as being part of the problem space, part of the domain to you, is different than it would be to me. That's just a proviso. Um, I'm sure the code that I'm going to show will have some of you up in arms and crying for my head. And that's because you have different tastes. So nothing fundamentally flawed, hopefully. So how many people flew here? That's a lot of people. Okay. Uh, how many of you used, you got your ticket through an online website of some sort? I'm pro that's probably every single person who raised their hand before. When you go to find a ticket online, there are a bunch of different places you can go. Right? You can go to Orbitz, you can go to Travelocity, Expedia, and they give you a subset of the possible tickets and prices, importantly, that are out there. So if you go to Orbitz, you hit like seven different airlines, and XP and Travelocity get everybody, but Southwest, I think. Uh, cheap tickets gets lots of people, but they have completely random other deals. So what happened is that some sites became travel, instead of travel search engines, they become travel search engine aggregators. And kayak.com is one. So last weekend, I was in Italy, speaking at Rails to Italy. And I, a month before that, I went to buy a ticket so I went to all the usual suspects and, and didn't like the prices. So I did some more searching, and I found a couple of these search engine aggregators. One was sidestep.com, and kayak.com was one. And I ended up, I think I used sidestep, but kayak caught my attention for something uh, unrelated. I'm looking around the site, as I tend to do, because um, of the eyes and whatnot. And I found a page called, what is it called? Technologies or something. It might have been off the FAQ. And when I got to that page, I saw this. Ooh, a search API. That sounds cool. I wonder what it does. Well, I probably could guess what it does because it's a search API. But I wonder if there's any more information to be found about it. So I go to this page and I scroll down a little bit and I see, ooh, a Ruby sample? That's even cooler. What does it look like? I wonder. Could it look like Ruby? Maybe. And this might not work. This is what it looked like. And don't worry about trying to read it. Um, you'll, see, you'll see more about it in a little bit. <laughs> and it's going to slow down now because it's getting to the end. And there. Okay. So that's what I saw. And I said, whoa. <laughs> I thought I got out of PHP. It's, it, that code, the part of the reason I didn't show it to you screen by screen is because it's a mess. It, it looks like PHP. It's got, some of the methods have underscores separating the words and some are all squished together. Happily there's no camel case. Um, it's, it made my eyes bleed a little bit just from the corners. Um, so I thought, again, I didn't use Kayak so I didn't have to you know, work with this. Not that I, they have a web interface so I wouldn't have to work with this anyway. But I thought, hey, I've got this pocket RubyConf coming up where I'm supposed to be refactoring a chunk of ugly code. And I just found some ugly code. So I set out to make this more domain specific. Right now this is actually domain specific. It's domain specific to crappy PHP-like web services, which is not a domain that you really want to code for a lot. Like nobody lives in crappy PHP domain web services land for long. So when you go to write a DSL, the, the strategy I've found, I'm oh, sorry, did I say DSL? DSD, because I'm not actually going to be writing a parser, because that still scares me with the big zombie guy with the DSL. Um, 
The strategy I found that help is to start at the end. Right? Just like when you're little and you're doing mazes and you want to get it done faster than your friends, so you start at the exit and you work your way back because there are less dead ends. Yeah. Same thing. Incidentally, to try to work back from this is still really hard. <laughs> so starting at the end, what do I want to do? Well, I want to find fli flights leaving from Charlotte and going to RDU that leave today and get back in one week. I have family in the town, so I want to visit them sometime. Now, starting at the end means you take that statement and you translate it into what, in a previous life, I would have called pseudocode, but now I can actually call valid Ruby, right? Yes. So, I want to find flights from Charlotte to RDU, leaving today, returning in a week. And this is the part where taste can vary, right? You might not like this. You might think this is the ugliest sin on the face of the earth other than the PHP-like Ruby sample that I showed you a minute ago. And if you don't think that that's uglier, I can show it to you again. So this is sort of my target, what I was aiming for. And to do that search in the old API, I've got two slides on this, right? And you know we're serious now because we're in the black background that I told you about before? This is code, serious code. So the first thing it does is it gets a session ID. Then it uses that session ID to get a search ID with your conditions. And then it uses that search ID multiple times. It keeps going back and getting 10 more flights, 10 more flights, 10 more, until it's all done. Or your computer crashes because you used up all your memory. Which actually happened. So yay, sample API. So, um, and then this part down here is actually, this is the method that gets the results back from their web service. And then this is the method that turns those results into their, their, uh, their leg objects for flights, right? So each flight is a leg. Now, again, look, thinking about starting at the end, we have to look at what is sent out from their API to their web service endpoint, and that's what we want to replicate, right? Because if we can do that, then they'll give us back the data we expect and we can parse it however we want. So these are the things that, if you were to run the program, it would send out. These are the URLs that it would hit. The first one uses your token. Uh, the second one uses a bunch of the data you entered and, and your search ID, that, your session ID that you got from the first one. And the third one is where it goes to get the results each time. So the way we make sure that our code does that is by setting up expectations. This is using Mocha. Right? So I'm going to... I'm using a stripped down version of the what I want to do thing. Just I want to find flights. And I want to make sure that it, it goes to the right place to get the session ID. And uh, there's code for that that passes. Once that passes, you want to make sure that when you get the session ID back, you can use it. It's not just all locked up into XML. So this is the test that checks to make sure that you can extract a valid session ID uh, when it's sent back to you from there. So we've seen the test that'll let us make sure that we're sending the right thing out, and the test that'll make sure we're reading the right thing back. So this is the first cut of the rewrite into more Ruby-looking code. And what you'll notice is that my code is a lot shorter than the sample I showed you earlier. It's because I'm only doing actually a really limited subset of what it does. Uh, you could obviously expand it, but I think this is enough to get the flavor. So here, um, I'll show you the... So in that test, you see kayak.find symbol flights. So what this is doing, it defines a method called find. It takes a type, so it can be flights or hotel, and a set of conditions, and it sets them into class variables. This is a pretty quick port from their API, which used class variables all over the place, and, and again, made my eyes bleed just a little bit from the corners. So we've, here we're getting a session ID by initializing session. We're setting all those conditions, and then we're initializing search based on those conditions in the session ID. And this, this is not domain specific at all, right? It's, it's the direct port to sort of get my tests running with the, the style of code that I wanted to use, right? The kayak.find flights with all the conditions. So I then refactored it to this, which actually looks to me a lot more domain specific. So suddenly, Instead of using a symbol to talk about flights, I'm actually, I've got a flight class. I'm talking about flights. Um, I'm still using something like the class variables with that hash, the search options hash, but that could be pulled out into attributes. So you're talking about flight.origin, flight.destination, all of that. 
And then session is now its own thing, so it, it, it's sort of encapsulated off on the side, not hurting anybody. And what both the first cut and the second cut do is give me that. I can still find flights with a set of conditions, and I'll return them. The interesting thing about writing domain-specific code is that you're never done. You're never going to be able to model the domain ex exactly. So you should always strive to get closer. There's always room for improvement. You can always talk more in the language of the problem space. The, the code I put up there is not a huge improvement, but it's talking in the language of the problem space. Instead of the, the old way, right, where it's all web services and you're talking entirely in the PHP-like web service domain, here we're actually starting to talk about flights and, it, and it's understandable. So given that there's always room for improvement, I've got a series of tips for getting you improved. And again, this is where taste may vary, so you might not like these. I know the Rubinius guys won't like one of them in particular. Um, but they, they work, and, and you might have your own, and if so, I'd be glad to hear about them in a couple minutes. The first one is use symbols. There's something about quotation marks around strings of characters that sort of breaks you out of the I'm talking in English. So here, I'm talking about flights. If you read this off, it reads like English. It reads like domain specific. I want to find flights from Charlotte to RDU, leaving today, getting back in a week, returning in a week. The symbols make that a lot easier to parse than putting everything in strings, because you're going to have double quotes or single quotes all over the place. Um, the other benefit is when you're in the domain, you're going to reuse the same words over and over, and so you get all the benefits of symbols over strings. The next tip is that, you know, hey, Ruby's grammar is flexible, right? So we can drop parentheses in a lot of cases. It makes it look, how many sentences do you see that, you know, drop part of it into a parenthetical aside? Part of the essential meaning of the sentence as opposed to a parenthetical aside. So again here, right, find is just a method. So in a lot of languages, you'd be, you'd be forced to put parentheses. But here you don't have to. It reads more like a sentence. It reads more like the domain. This is a method I didn't use, and this is the longest slide in the presentation. I'll give you a minute to read it as I talk about it. So any method in Ruby can take a block. Right? You can either pass it in implicitly and then call it with yield, or you can identify it explicitly in the signature to the method and use call. And that lets you do some really powerful things. Um, that's actually, if you look at our spec, right? It's Describe, do, end. Everything in there is described. It's it, do, end. Everything there is it. Maybe not a great example of a meaningful language, but it's still there. The next one I also didn't use in this particular example, but the splat operator is really powerful for this. Um, if single and double quotes break you out of thinking about talking in English, and parentheses break you out, square brackets are just as bad. So what Splat lets you do is in the method, you can accept all the other arguments, stuff them into an array sort of after the fact. If you needed to pass in an array before, you can just do it by passing them individually and then have the method receive them as an array and use them however you need to. And then the last one is the one that the Rubinius guys, I think, don't like. You can pass, and this is one that's used in Active Record and throughout Rails, right? The last argument to a method, if it's a hash, you can just drop the curly braces. It's another thing that breaks you out of thinking about how you describe the problem in English or in your native language. You don't see this a lot in DSLs. Um, I used it here because the options you're going to pass can change dramatically from search to search. I think it makes sense when the order of the options doesn't matter and they're all named. Otherwise, you might want to use the splat operator to interpret them as an array. But I think this is an underappreciated part of Ruby's flexible grammar. So the keys are sort of start out modestly, right? You don't have to write a parser first thing off the bat, especially if you're new. Don't worry about having to write a parser. Just you know, name stuff well. Use the flexibility that Ruby's grammar gives you and, and go to town. 
staying in the domain is vital. Right? You're, just like the pilot plane pitch roll yaw example, you're going to catch stuff so much faster if you stay in the domain with how you think about and how you talk about your code. And coding is talking. Right? You're talking to the computer. You're talking to your fellow programmers. So remember that. Talk as clearly as possible. Whoops. Get better. Don't advance slides unnecessarily. Yeah. Just always focus on communicating your intent, staying in the domain, making it work more like people who are experts in the domain would expect it to work. And your code's going to be better. That's the key, right? That's it. I hope you all travel safely, especially those of you who bought tickets through kayak.com, not endorsed by kayak.com. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay. This sort of falls back on the sphere work hypothesis, right? The weak version, linguistic relativism. Right. I think that the words you use actually do matter. They, they sway how people think. And maybe you have to customize that for individual people. Yeah. But if you can find something, it's sort of majority rules, almost. Um, say that is that if you can avoid those negative connotations entirely or in large part by using the right words in the first place, then you won't have to overcome them and do it the right way later. Right. But my point is that those negative connotations are subjective. Sure. So you can't really avoid them for all people. Right. What I think is underlying points about, about the, the colloquial use of TSLs in the Ruby community is correct that they're not TSLs. Yeah. There is no language of being extended just reusing Ruby in order to... Right, but I think that's more of a... That, I, I, I think in that case, I think in a lot of cases, that is sort of a distinction for, with the wrong difference. But from the point of view of somebody coming to use it, that, I mean, that's a nice feature and whatnot, but it doesn't really affect how they perceive the DSL. You know what I'm saying? Well, it's, more, it's, more, it's a nice feature that I can write a DSL like, like the, the DSL that you, or, that you find in Rails, without having to write a parser, although that was one of the technical points I wanted to I'm going to argue with you on, on, on this comment at the end of time, but, but on one point, yeah. that all the DSLs that we have, rig, uh, models, so on and so forth, are all one-word constructs. You know, at best, you can attack on a block and everything, but there's no language to it. There's no yeah, construct. I'm not arguing, 
you're wearing when you think about it. First, I yes, put it in the That's right. Pardon? I want to address something else, which is that uh, part of the confusion is that the word language is an English word, and it's also a technical term in a field. And part of what bothers Ben about uh, language is that he has enough background in that field that that technical meaning of language is a linguistic bother. To most of the rest of us, we use it very loosely uh, because it's just this English word that refers to, and then we're sort of lumping dialects and, and uh, everything else into that. Well, um, and, and I think that's okay, and I think that's what you're saying. And in some discussions, we need to get down to very precise uses use of it, as Ben's doing, and that's fine. It's probably also influenced by the fact that we are all, or almost all, native English speakers. We're used to using our base language. Sure. French. I just want to say one quick thing. I think it's really valuable to separate what I'm calling real DSLs from domain-specific dialects. Because right? when they're lumped together, you don't know which one you're going to get when you ask somebody what a DS, what, uh, show me a DSL. Right? Rich's example is amazing. Still over my head. But, but actually, wait, I want to, what did you have to say? Well, yeah. well actually, I hadn't finished my. Well, just one second. fast divisions between anything exactly. in, in We're having a very violent agreement. Yes. <laughs> okay. Amy? Uh, I know, 
today got to try uh, an Amazon Barava, um, who have only three words for numbers, or so the anthropologists tell us one, two, and many. Um, the older Barava were unable to learn to differentiate between numbers other than those, but the younger ones were able to learn numbers um, as you know, used just about every other standard language uh, in the world. So it's a matter of flexibility. And I come from all to all this stuff from a very different background than all of you. I had a very hard time learning about loops. For, for example, when I was learning the program, um, I'd say they've been called coils instead because really they do this. They don't just do this. They actually kind of move along forward through things that might have helped me. Um, I think we could stand here and argue semantics all night long, but the fact is that we all have very different perspectives. So we could all be right for our individual selves but never know if anything affects the other person. So I think that's kind of conversation in the <laughs> <laughs> okay, does anybody? I, I would go through this whole domain specific language thing really uh, now for like a year. Like, who do you give these languages to? You give them, you to, give them to other programmers. Not always. Would, would, you, give, would you write a PSL that you would give to a physicist? Uh, a physicist? Yes, actually. I know, I know physicists who write their own DSLs. So, yeah. And one of the strengths of what Rich does and the examples he talks about uh, is that uh, he, he deliberately writes DSLs that he gives to domain experts on the projects he works on, and not necessarily to write them, but they can certainly read them and evaluate them and discuss their correctness and say, no, that's not how it works. And a lot of useful dialogue comes out of that. Everybody has their own Right, but there are there are constants. Right, in philosophy, symbolic logic. Every philosopher does symbolic. They use the same symbols for symbolic logic. And I think the same way that RSpec lends itself to creating those specifications. That's not something you would necessarily give to another programmer, though you could. They would find value in it. You could also give that to a client and say, okay, well, for this controller, we're talking about Rails and RSpec, it does these things. Well, what about this? It doesn't say that it does that. So they can quickly hone in on something that's wrong. Write a new specification. Write code to make that spec better, and then then you're satisfied. Yes. I think that even if the ultimate user, the physicist, doesn't see the code, it gets the developer thinking in the same terms and communicating in those terms. And so it's very valuable in that perspective. Yeah, and that's the keeping your head in the domain part. Anybody who is skeptical about uh, the use of domain-specific languages, I would encourage to read uh, Eric Evans' book. Yeah. Uh, it discusses building a what he calls a domain language uh, as a as a com uh, yeah as a common and it's not a code language it's not a formal language or a way of writing the code it's building a common vocabulary between the uh, users and the, the developers so they can talk to each other and uh, the kinds of DSLs that we're talking about here in the Ruby community to me is just an extension of that that carries it all the way forward so that we can code in a language very similar to the language that we use to talk to our users. And uh, that keeps your head in the domain and limits the dissonance between you know, the conversation you have and then how you go tell the computer about it and all those things. And it's a tool for thought. Anyone else have comments? And I think we respect Amy's wishes and end the conversation here.